So in the journey to mastery, what I've seen is you pick something and that thing creates the tension to have those beautiful experiences that money can't buy. So you think it's to get health, wealth, higher purpose, love, all that. And it is, it gets you that actually. But there's some things that money can't buy. So there's a great book called Mastery by George Leonard. Put your hands up if you read Mastery by George, Len George Leonard. The world's changing. Most of you have a TikTok account. Most of you have not read Mastery by George Leonard. Wild, right? Isn't that crazy? Scary. How many of you read the Tao Te Ching? Put your hands up. Scary. Scary. The Tao Te Ching. Put your hand up if you read the Tao Te Ching. Okay, scary. Think of all the trash you've read. All the trash you've read. Wow. That's amazing. Okay, well, I got to do a better job. So look, um, what George Leonard says, he's the one that quoted, what's the big quote that he says that's popular? 10, anyone know? Anybody know? 10,000 hours to mastery. Repeat that after me. It's debatable. We'll go with it. 10,000 hours to mastery. You know, Tony Robbins, he's got all these great quotes, right? He's like, just say yes. You know, so the words go, yes, right? I'm like, 10,000. That's what all my seminars look like. I give these long quotes. So what he said was there's different types of people. One of them is what's called a dabbler. Say the word dabbler. 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 That's somebody who loves to start things. You ever just start a bunch of things, but you don't finish them? You ever do that? That's called dabbling. And I, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna tell you how I think about this in my mind, but it's very rude, okay? So I don't use this term lightly, but it's a very, very rude term. I'm just giving you a window into how I think of dabbling. I'm not saying this to laugh. It's like dark gallows humor. Um, I don't take this as a joke, but in my brain, when I see people dabbling, I call that aborted fetus syndrome aborted fetus syndrome, appropriate for uh, what we're, we're social society is going through now. So, but I've called it that for years in my mind. And when I say that, what it is, is like the sperm goes to the egg, life begins, the potential, the beauty, the, all the things that could happen. And then it just goes out the toilet. It's an aborted fetus. And it's unfortunate, right? Because there's an, an inner potency that's there that gets lost. So again, you know, I'm, not, I'm, no, I, I'm disgusted by thinking that because it's very sad, it's a sad thing. I'm just giving you a window into what I honestly personally feel when I see it. It's like the beauty of life starting and then it falls flat. It just doesn't come together. So I'm giving you that extreme or shocking verbiage, not to laugh at it, but to show you that I get extreme about unmet potential. There's, imagine, like I said, imagine if in the news we had it to where the big news was potential wasn't being met. And we said, why don't we use our collective resources to help our potential to get met? Now, when I say those words, is there anybody in here where you start looking at your life and you realize there's so many areas of your life that have potential that you didn't follow up? So, anybody feel that way? Put your hand up if you ever felt that way. Anybody that didn't put their hands up? Lack of self-awareness, because my hand's going right up. Now, that's the idea of being a dabbler. You start, you don't finish. Do you have to start, do you have to finish everything you start? No. Great book by Seth Godin, it's called The Dip. It's, it's called A Little Book on When to Quit. It's actually great. You don't have to just finish everything you start. But be honest about all the amazing things that you started that you didn't finish. Let's take 30 seconds to talk to the person beside you on either side, 30 seconds about amazing things that you started that you didn't finish. Do that right now, let's go for it. I bet you guys could talk about this for hours. I could feel tangibly the energy coming out of the room. Like I could have probably left that combo going 20 minutes and you'd still be talking about it. And, it, and, it, and it's cathartic and it's powerful to recognize it. Now the next one that George Leonard talked about, he calls it the hacker. And that is somebody, I'm gonna get the exact list, it's his work. Oh no, sorry, the second one he gives, he calls it the obsessive. Obsessive characteristics, wants the magic pill. They're fine to put in the effort, but they won't put in the time. They fail to observe the time-tested principles of success. They reject that mastery is cumulative and requires solid foundation. And eventually they run out of gas. 
So there's probably some of you in this room where you're willing, to, you're willing uh, to put in the time, but you want the magic pill. Now, that's okay. You want a shortcut? I'll help you with shortcut. But is that really the ultimate way to get ahead? No. It's not, okay? Everything that I did, when I talked to you about staying awake till eight in the morning to work on public speaking, is that a shortcut? Actually it is putting the time in, but it's not that kind of shortcut. The other one is a hacker. Hacker, they put in the work and they quit once they're comfortable. They can't figure out why they never get the real benefits. The key, according to George Leonard, is to become a master. A master is about being a lifelong learner. A master begins, maintains a beginner's mind. He gave a story where the founder of judo asked to be buried in his white belt after death. There's no experts, only learners further down the path. Practice for the sake of practice. You'll have plateaus. You gotta keep practicing. Even when it feels like you're getting nowhere. Find enjoyment in all aspects of the curve. Rewards come to the people that commit to the process, but the journey is the ultimate reward. Engage with the process. Now, the next thing, and this is very, very key, is that if you want to gain mastery, you have to learn from those who have also gained mastery. A basic idea would be, we have our friend at the front of the room here earlier, and he's using his voice, and there's breakthroughs that occurred. In my case, I've done public speaking 10,000 hours, nah, <laughs> nah, okay? When you see me doing something called the free tour, that should really be called Owen trying to copy George Leonard tour. That's me wanting to bank hours in front of crowds. I'm just trying to bank hours in front of crowds. Y'all can tell I'm annoyed that we'll have to wrap this eventually tonight. It annoys me. I can do this morning till night, seven days a week. Not forever, but for a long time. I've done them, I've done huge events like that. So, you know, I used to go out sometimes every day to work on social skills from noon until four in the morning for years. I didn't say that in my videos because I worried that people would copy it. I came from light level autism, so I was, I was worried if I said the exact truth that people would copy it and that it would be too extreme and they'd get uh, frustration with it. So I don't want people to copy me. I didn't feel that everybody should do that. I don't think everybody should do that. I think balance actually can add to your results. But I understood that if I couldn't read social cues, doing that, having basically Asperger's, I knew that I need to practice again and again and again. So for me, there's an ROI. For the average person, that's too crazy. But for me, it wasn't too crazy. I was always learning. I was learning and learning and learning. It never bothered me to do that at all. So I can, I can tell you that from decades of being in front of crowds, it was these little moments that something popped for me. And that little moment might be something every two months. Sid was able to learn public speaking quickly because I gave him five or six things to do. And you're thinking it's only five or six things? Yes, but those five or six things took 20 years. There's an old expression, there's this big apartment building, and the crap starts exploding out of all the piping. And in the entire apartment building, thousands of people, they're being flooded with poop. And so what happens is the plumber comes over, he bonks on the pipes, he bonks on another pipe, turns a knob, and everyone's saved from the poop. And they say, how much is that? He says, it's $10,000. And the landlord, the owner is shocked. He said, can you give me a detailed billing on $10,000 to turn a knob? He says, sure. Turning the knob, $1. Knowing which knob to turn, $9,999, right? And that is what it means to get a mentor. That is what it means to learn from people that have walked the path, people that have showed you through their behavior with things they can't fake, so why I personally go and make you know, a free tour channel, I go do speaking, I release the speaking, you see it. So that's why I coach a lot of top people in public speaking. If you want to get ahead and you want to gain mastery, first of all, commit to mastery. Second of all, you've got to learn from the right sources. The problem is if you're learning the wrong thing, you're practicing the wrong thing. And so what happens is that you're kind of, you know, say that you're going like this, but you're, learning, you're practicing the wrong thing, 
you wind up over here. It's like you're digging a tunnel, you're digging, you're digging, you're digging, you're digging. You know what you realize? You're digging down the wrong tunnel. So if you wanna be the best, go to the top. Learn from the best. Now, what I'm gonna get into, and this I see a lot, is the coping pattern where people refuse to learn. I laid it out here. This, for me, this is unconscious competence. So why is it that even being an event like this speeds up your learning curve? Why is it a coping pattern to refuse to be coached? It's because you're prioritizing ego over results, okay? And so here's the basic way that I explain it to you. I'll just borrow your table there. So earlier on, when I had Dylan up here, I had our friend up here, and we're doing the work, there's something called the winner effect, okay? The winner effect is that when you feel like you're better than other people, it gives your brain dopamine. And you, now, uh, Robert Sapolsky has done studies on this. You can look it up. He's done studies on baboons. And it's actually quite unfortunate, but a lot of human society is just people trying to kick each other's heads down as a way to get dopamine. Now, I've never done cocaine, but I can tell you this. They say about cocaine, it's like ruffles. Bet you can't eat just one. So you're rarely, the joke they say is you're rarely going to see a coke addict wake up with like a little extra coke still in the bag for tomorrow. Whatever coke is there, they're snorting it. I actually never did coke. Maybe we might have a more conservative, forward-thinking cokehead here. You could talk to me after and tell me how you do it. Okay? So going from there, why can a cokehead not stop snorting coke? What are they getting from it? A direct line of dopamine. Now, that dopamine is meant to be saved for when you're winning. It's meant to be an incentive to win. It's an evolutionary system of the mind to get you to go out and win. But we, just like with cocaine, just like with the cocaine, what happens is we want to bypass it. So what happens there? What is an easier way than putting in 10,000 hours to get the same dopamine as somebody who did 10,000 hours? Say they're stupid. Call them dumb. Look at, yeah, look at that. That's stupid. Now, what winds up happening is that we get around really accomplishing things by just thinking that we're better than other people. Now, what this does, okay, you want to go real deep on this? You guys want to go real deep on this idea? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to encourage you to think about the, the, con the, the idea of Satan as a metaphor for what I call and this is really out there, I call it an early reaping. An early reaping. So you're taking the fruit before it's ripened. It's, it's like there's this apple there, and well, funny, I said apple. I didn't even mean to make that correlation, but you know, there's a fruit there, whatever the case, and you, maybe that is another, oh my God. Okay, so basically what it is, is you take the apple prematurely rather than getting the main benefit. So you take the premature version, right? So when somebody's doing coke, what are they really doing? They're, they're saying, I'm gonna fry Swiss cheese holes in my brain and bring demons into my soul, but I'm gonna feel awesome right now. It's the exact same thing when you look down on other people to feel better than them rather than getting to their level. It's the same thing. And there's people addicted on it. You can find entire corners of the internet and that's all people do all day is pump the dopamine button. You'll never see me doing that because I'm scared to do that. It's, it's, I'm actually, I'm, I'm more afraid to do that than to take a sledgehammer and bash myself in the hand and just paralyze one hand. If you're like, become them, become somebody who is psychologically dominated by the need to trash other people to feel good about your crap results, literally, you can lose your soul doing that. So I'd rather just lose my hand. That's also from the Bible. Remember the quote from the Bible that talks about that? What's the quote, anybody know? No, it's, no, by Jesus. Yeah, I'd actually like to hear the Proverbs one later. What's the one by Jesus? It's like, yeah, better to lose your eye than to get cast into hell. And hell isn't just, you're going to burn, you're going to burn, you're, right? You could do that while alive. That's, that same hell happens while alive. Okay, so the need to trash other people in order to feel good about yourself, the person looks empowered by it. And you can, you can tangibly look at somebody who's being run by that. And you can see how it feeds them. They're poop eaters. You can see how it feeds, they're like, ha ha ha, yeah, ha ha ha, ha ha ha. Like they have this certain laugh, this snide laugh that you'll see where they're, they're awakened by it, right? If they see somebody winning, that may not awaken them. They see, you, nature, you're not gonna see them in nature probably. You're not going to see them out in the mountains of Montana, probably. You're not going to see them wanting children in many cases. 
or wanting to bring their children up on stage. What makes them happy is that short-term dopamine spike of feeling better than somebody else. But not even, not even having it be true, but just feeling it. And so that there, what we do, is the same reason why people won't get mentors. It's the exact same reason why. People get put in this loop where they can't learn from other people. It's crazy, it happens all the time. They can't learn from others. And so they're, they're, their mind is closed off. And what they're doing, it's a continual ongoing pattern where they are always needing to feel better than other people. Now the same pattern, by the way, also blocks you with getting good with social skills, doesn't it? Because you're afraid to go meet somebody, not have it go well, and then if it doesn't go well, it, it breaks that, that winner effect. Oh, someone didn't like me. So you actually get afraid of losing dopamine. That's the main reason why you're afraid of rejection, right? You're afraid of having your dopamine drop. A lot of what I was doing up here earlier with the vocals was me trying to show you how not to care if your dopamine drops. That's why we, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to that groupthink brainwashing because we're afraid to lose dopamine if we get made fun of or kicked out of the tribe. You see what's going on there? What I'm look, what I'm teaching you here is gonna be very, very high level personal growth. It's meant to help you make a lot of cash. It's meant to help you get a better social life. It's meant to make you happier. It's meant to help you get a lot. But it's really on a level that is a lot more vital to your overall well-being than even those things. Those things, that's the retail version. That's the retail version of what people think they want. You don't even know that you want that other level. By the way, the reason you don't know is because most people don't know, and then creators don't make videos with titles like that because if I put out a title like that, it's too abstract and unrelatable, and so people won't look it up. So the system creates its own stagnation. The system creates its own stagnation. You see how that works? It creates a sort of a yes man situation around a king. When we get rid of the king and everybody becomes a king, that's good, but what's the problem with kings? They're surrounded by people pandering to them. So you also get pandered to. And you don't know what you don't know as a result because people are not financially incentivized to tell you what you don't know. Do you get that? Like remember the billionaire client that I told you about earlier? If I just say to him, oh, you want this surface level thing, here, I'll give it to you, I instantly get a million dollar paycheck. But if I say, no, this is pathetic, he, gets, he starts shaking and freaking out and I get nothing. So I, there's a lack of incentive to tell the truth. He doesn't know that. I'm probably the only person that told him the truth all month. And he can't figure out why his life's a mess. But he's not ready. There's not an opening there. Why is there not an opening? Because it's the first time it's happened. Dopamine. Okay? When does an opening occur? When it becomes more painful to stay the same than to get criticism. When your dopamine is so incredibly low that you can't take it anymore. You're like, my dopamine's just too low. I can't take this. This is so painful. Tell me what I have to do. Who here has been in a situation where you're just so much in pain, either financially, relationship-wise, spiritually, happiness, vitality, and you're just like, you know what? Tell me what to do. What I gotta do? What do I have to do? I get it. Thank you for putting your hand up on that. So I got there. I knew about trauma healing for years. You guys are gonna learn a lot more about that tomorrow. But I said, it's okay. I don't need to learn that. And then Julian Gate, simultaneous breakup, and I was like, I'm ready. <laughs> Just like, I'm freaking ready. I gotta let go of the trauma. I'm in so much pain. I was in so much pain. I would wake up in the middle of the night feeling like someone was punching me in the head. No joke. And I'm saying a lot of really hyperbolic things today. That isn't one of them. I can remember waking up feeling like someone had just cranked me in the head. Crazy, because I was in so much trauma. Julian got real PTSD from it. We're lucky he didn't kill himself. And so, from that standpoint, we went through that. I got put in enough pain, Julian got put in enough pain. We said, we gotta learn trauma healing. And him and I studied trauma healing about half a decade. And you know how we get when we study something. So we went very, very deep on it. I covered trauma healing in my mentorships. As a chunk of what I do, Julian's got one where that's the entire thing he does. He's a psycho, it's amazing. I had to get to that point. For me, with social skills, it was me getting into an amazing college. It's kind of like, a, like an Ivy League type school, but in Canada, so you never heard of it. <laughs> and great college, whole life ahead of me. I've arrived! But my girlfriend dumped me, and I messed up my school. And I was on a trajectory either to go to law school or to be a PhD. Imagine me as a, as a school professor. 
<laughs> Imagine that. Would that have been fun? We had had a lot of fun. And I had great professors at Queens, in Kingston, Ontario, and I want to be like them. I want to be a professor. I wanted to do that. My great grandfather, Russell Cook, was a preacher in World War II. So I had that public speaking in my genes. Dylan has that in his genes, and he will cultivate that, and you'll see. And so, you know, but we're awakening that process, right? So, what it is, right, because it's not just epigenetics, it's also you have to awaken it. An amazing thing happened, and each of you has unique talents that are in you that you can awaken. And I've seen it come out of them, I saw it in Philadelphia. So, basically, what you see is that you get in so much pain, you're willing to learn. In my case, you want to hear something funny about the social skill stuff? I'd actually had heard of it. I'd heard about that stuff. And you know what I said? I said, if I ever saw somebody that was trying to get better with social skills, I'd punch them in the face. I, you know who told me about all that stuff? It was my mom. She's like, this crazy guy teaches this. I'm like, that guy's a jerk. If I ever saw that guy, I'd punch him in the face. I said that to Virtue Signal. I said that to White Knight. I was, I was like in a White Knight psyche. I was like, well, if I, if I say that that person's bad, then maybe somebody will love me. That's what I was doing. It's called White Knighting. Imagine me as a White Knight. Imagine me as a chode. That's what I was. I was a chode white knight. Full out. Yeah, for real. I was a virgin. I was like, I'm going to get married to someone. It'll be my first time, their first time. I was saying this stuff because I didn't know what to do. I thought if I white knighted, somebody would appreciate me. <laughs> I tried. Does that work? No. Okay? So, understand that an opening is your greatest gift. The greatest thing that can happen to you is when you're in so much pain that you're willing to learn. So all your friends that you're seeing, the reason they're unable to learn is because the reason they're not willing to take the path to mastery is for the fact that they're not in enough pain. And the dopamine is running their psyche. Now this is where it gets subtle. That last little line that I dropped should not be underestimated. Don't underestimate that last line. Don't let that just kind of slide on by. Again. The dopamine is running them. The need for the dopamine has usurped their will. It's usurped their discernment. It has usurped their ability to access flow. They've lost will, discernment, and independent access to flow. So now what's going on is they are not themselves. And there's layers and layers and layers and layers and layers to this. So when I'm talking to you, I'm looking at you in the eye, and you know what I'm seeing? I'm seeing layers of unconsciousness. I'm seeing layers of you being run. I'm seeing layers of things that are using you like a puppet that you're not even aware of. And what it's doing is it's sucking you of energy. So a lot of what it is that I teach is how to build salmon and energy, but it's coming from a standpoint of taking off the parasitic entities on your energy. Okay, now when you hear that, you're like, like sounds kind of dumb, right? It's like the parasitic entities on your energy, right? It just sounds stupid, okay? So, you've got to make a choice of what matters more. That's like, ultimately, that's what it's going to come down to, okay? It's going to completely come down to what matters more. Do you want to learn or do you want to feel like you already get it? Now, people that are very, very successful, they typically have five or 10 coaches, they're typically learning from the best, and the big thing is learn faster. Repeat that after me, learn faster. Okay, so when I'm working on social skills, I'm getting faster by doing it a lot, I'm getting, I'm getting better faster by getting mentors, I'm getting faster by committing the process, I'm getting faster by eking out small distinctions, I'm getting better faster by getting quick reference experiences. You see people trying to get better socially, they're at a bar club, and they go talk to one person, they come back and they sit there derping. It's too slow. You're not gonna get good like that. You try to get better at business. You try one or two things, it's too slow. You know it. You're hearing it, you're like, yeah, it is. So get in your groups right now for 30 seconds and talk about the things that you're doing too slow and be honest with yourself about where you're gonna arrive. Do that just for a sec. I just want you to be real about that. Do that now. Biggest problem of being a hater is you can't learn. The exact people that you should be modeling, you're not learning from, right? In business, you know what they tell you? Look at what your competitors are doing and take the best from what they're doing. But if you're stuck saying, oh, I can't, 
you know, they suck, I'm the good one. If you're stuck doing that, you can't learn. In truth, the people that I work with one-on-one -on -one that are wealthy, I'm not their only coach. They've usually got 10 or 15 coaches in, in key critical areas. Now, a couple main points here. Why people are crazy, not to learn from others. Number one, do you teach yourself how to tie your shoes? No. You teach yourself how to speak English? No. Everything you've ever done, even your bad habits you learned, you're always learning from other people. You gotta consciously take, take control of that process. You're always being programmed. You gotta choose where you're getting that from. You're always being programmed. Like I was showing you at the beginning today. Most people have very, very low standards for who they're letting in their head. But you're always learning via osmosis. You become who you hang out with. You talk like them, you act like them, you raise or lower to their standards. Modeling, this is classic Tony Robbins stuff that he talks about. I believe it's from NLP or something, but it's common in self-help. Just giving you some common cliches of personal growth. Success leaves clues. Model is successful. Look at their beliefs, their paradigms, their habits, behaviors, systems, use of time, psychology, focus, and proximity to them is power. If you want to be successful, find somebody who's achieved the result that you want, do what they're doing, you get a similar result. Have a sense of identity where you know who you are even when you're learning from others. Right, people are like, well if I learn from others, does that mean I'm not me? I, I think you should kind of know who you are more than that. So, have an identity as an action taker. Have an identity where you know who you are beyond some basic thing, but realize that your standards, your lifestyle, your happiness are very improvable. And don't feel like that's taking you away from who you are. So, the idea of protection or growth is a base level Line in the sand. What does that mean? And thank you. You're either in protection or growth. What I've just described here is people that are in protection. Most people are in protection. How do we know? When we had our friend up here earlier, I said, use your voice. What, what's the best word to describe that actually? Protection. Another word you could describe that is as a contraction. So it's a contracted psyche. And, and that's why I, I pound on it that hard. If I see my son in a contraction, I'm like, let's keep going until he can work through it, even if it's tough. So it's expansion versus contraction. Most people are, are in contraction. What do they do? Now they've got to use drugs and alcohol. Now they've got to poison themselves. Now they've got to use mind-numbing uh, entertainment. I said education is a Freudian slip, funny. So you want to always be getting out of that, okay? Just all the time, all the time, all the time being get out of that. And you want to be raising your standards you want to have high, high sense of urgency. You want to have urgency to the point that you've recognized the pain that you're in, you have felt it, you've audited where it's taking you, and you said, I want to get out of this. And then what you do is you pick some kind of journey to mastery that scares you. You find great mentors, great people to learn from. You get a mastermind group, you get peers, and you burn the boats. You ever heard the idea of burning the boats? Who here's never heard the expression burning the boats? Put your hands up, I'm just curious. Okay, burning the boats, the basic idea is that there's old warriors who'd go into war and as soon as they would get on the enemy's island or shores, they'll burn the boats so they have no choice but to go forward. Just straight up. And so when you have a choice, you can usually talk your way out of it. But you can throw your hat over the fence. What's the best way to go over the fence? Take your hat, throw it over the fence. Now you gotta go get your hat. You gotta get an ROI. Very, very common thing. I can remember when I would every year say I'm gonna go hiking in summer, and I want to do some winter activities in winter. And every year I had a reason not to. I kept kicking the can down the road. And now 20 years goes by in my life, I didn't do it. So what I did was, I went and bought $10,000 in winter jackets. Canada Goose at Montclair, it's like two jackets. <laughs> no, it's, um, but that's actually what I did. I bought, like, I bought about 10K in winter jackets. Probably about 20K by all said and done. So I did that. Now, why did I go buy 10 or 20K in winter jackets? Because I wanted to annoy myself. I wanted to be to where I had an identity as somebody who goes out in winter. I bought boots, beanie, gloves, everything. Canada, we called it a toque. You guys called it a toque here? Yeah. Okay, in Canada, we called it a toque. So basically bought all this stuff. Well, now I've got the nicest winter jackets you've ever seen sitting in my closet. Anybody that comes over, like, wow, you must like to go out in winter. I'm like, <laughs> I feel like an idiot. So you know what wound up happening? I wound up buying that stuff. Now you say to me, why do you have to do that to uh, go out in winter? Like Owen, Owen, why don't you just go out in winter? Why do you need those jackets? Like, did you kind of just want them? 
kind of did, but it wasn't just that. It was that I knew that every single winter, I'm working on the business, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I always have some excuse not to actually go out and winter. So what I wound up doing by buying that was I wound up taking up skiing again. To be fair, that's also why I have a popped ACL. But I wound up, I wound up skiing every major ski resort with Dylan and Vincent in the country. Every major ski resort. I spent like four months skiing, nonstop. He learned how to ski. It was crazy, okay? And I, funny enough, I actually didn't fall a single time, even doing double blacks, all this stuff. Didn't fall a single time. And then the one time I fell, I popped my ACL. <laughs> so that's what happened. But yeah, what happened was Dylan and Vincent got away from me, and then I was like, oh crap, they went the other way, and I went down probably like the nasty hill, I shouldn't have done it. Um, it, it was just, uh, it was spring, and there was uh, very, very deep moguls, because in, see, I'm a new skier, so I didn't know this, I didn't have a mentor to tell me this, it's actually a good point. So what happened was, I didn't have an instructor with me, the, the uh, moguls get very, very deep as spring is coming, and I didn't have the right skis for it, and they wouldn't bend properly, and as a result, I uh, popped my ACL out, right? So it is what it is, I got, I got videos of the whole thing, it's pretty epic. So. Basically what happened was I, aside from that one nasty story, now by the way, the story is a two-sided story. I did get hurt. When you go after your mastery, you could get beat up a little bit, right? But is the answer to never go skiing? What do you think I'm gonna do as soon as I heal my leg? Go skiing. I'm gonna go skiing, I'm just gonna get a, a mentor. <laughs> so, you know, I got mentors for it, but not enough. So, basically what I did was I wound up going out in Yellowstone, I was out with Bisons, I was in Wyoming, I was up in Northern California, in Tahoe, I went everywhere that you could think of in winter, I went literally everywhere, it's all my Instagram story, anybody, who here watches my Instagram story regularly, put your hand up, any of you guys just see all the travel that I did the past couple years? Oh, it's crazy, you went through all this winter. Yeah, it's super, cra you're like, why? Like, why do you do this? because I bought $10,000 of winter jackets, <laughs> okay? So then what I did was I said I'm gonna replicate this and I went and bought only about 1,000 because they're cheaper in hiking boots. And next thing you know, and you might have seen this too, I'm up in waterfalls in Hawaii, I'm hiking everywhere, I went everywhere. All that it took was just me throwing my hat over the fence. So a lot of personal growth is basically just recognizing when you're playing small, recognizing that you're probably not gonna motivate yourself, recognizing that you're probably gonna stay stuck, and then whether you find a great mentor or do something to, to throw your hat over the fence. Maybe you tell everybody you're gonna go do something. You just tell everybody, I'm gonna go do something. They say that one of the greatest powerful elements of human psychology is the desire to be congruent to the way you're projecting yourself. You wanna look like the person you're projecting yourself as, otherwise you feel embarrassed. So if you tell everybody you're gonna go do something, that can work. What I used to do for social skills when I'd hand somebody $2,000 and I would tell them, I'm not even telling you to do this, I just did it for me, anecdotally, for myself, and I'd say, here's two grand, every time I go say hi to somebody, I want, I want uh, $200 back, but if I don't say hi to somebody, you're gonna crack me in the shoulder. Now, we had permission to do that. Don't just see me out there if I don't talk to someone, you just come punch me. I'm not saying do that. But I used to do that with, fr okay, I won't appreciate that, but you literally, there's always like that one dummy that's like, I'm doing the thing, you know, I'm saying that to my kid. But, I thought you said. But, you gotta be careful. But you see my point, right? So I was doing things to continually leverage myself. So you've gotta ask yourself, how can I put leverage on myself? So this is what I want you to do. Get together in your group here and talk to each other about ways that you could put pressure on yourself. Pick a path to mastery. Pick something, health, wealth, relationship, higher purpose, you really, really want in a major way. Connect your pain around, here's basically what it is. Question number one in your group is what is it that you want? Question number two is, what are the consequences if you don't go get it? And question number three is, how can you learn faster? Okay, do that with your group right now. Take like two minutes of pop, and then let's get it popping and we'll keep rolling here, okay? Do that right now, let's just go for it. Now, next up, people that are successful put a huge premium on time, it's all about saving time. They have a major, major value on their time. They wanna get good faster, it's about speed, and it's about not wasting time. Now, going from there, it's also about not wasting money. What do you spend most of your money on? Stuff, discretionary spending. People that are, are at a high level invest in themselves. So most of your money goes to something called the land of lost socks. You don't even know where it went. Where'd it go? I don't know. So what you wanna do is things that are actually adding value to you. Keep that in mind as well. You wanna have urgency. And the big thing is getting aerodynamic in your thinking and behavior and looking for major leverage. And that is what it is constantly all about. So we're talking about how to make money over the next couple of days. That's also what you're looking for is leverage, leverage, leverage. Now, the result of this ultimately, let me explain to you what the result of this, okay? I'm the kind of person where, like, I don't necessarily in some ways mind 
just living the regular life, like just watching TV, eating a biscuit, <laughs> you know, like just sitting there eating the biscuit, the TV, smoking the weed or whatever, you know, right? So, you know, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I don't smoke weed myself, but like I wouldn't have a problem with it. If I thought that was authentic and how we're meant to live, I'd actually be generally okay with that. I'd be like, you know what? The TV's cool, you know, a lot of experiences, you got the biscuit. So I honestly, that's how I'd be if I thought that's how we're authentically meant to live. But what I have found in my life, okay, just in general, what I've discovered is that life can get a lot better than that. People at a low level, they just soak in any crap that gets put in front of them. And that's why corporations know that, and I'm gonna say something very nuanced and subtle here, and please let this land, okay? Please, if even one thing lands today, let this land. These people will lie to you so bad because they know you have no attention span. All of you have already forgot what they did in 2020. None of you care. It's like, oh, I guess that's over now. You just forget. And then when they bring it back, you'll, you'll just go with that. It's like whatever just in front of you. And that's the world that we live in, right? And so what winds up happening, if you watch politicians, these people will lie and lie and lie and they'll just say anything because they know they won't be held accountable for it. They know that people are just gonna forget. They'll say anything. It's insane. That's how they get away with it. They realize there's no attention span. How do you get the most compliant public ever? Get it to where people's attention span are so spent and they're derping so hard that they're not gonna object to anything and they can't remember what you're doing. It's ridiculous and this is what's happening. And the sad thing is that I can come up here and tell you this and you still don't even hear it. You're like, yeah, yeah, because it's just another shiny thing in front of your face and you forget. It's freaking crazy. So they know they can literally just put anything in front of your face. Like they can make like the nastiest burger that poisons you, put a clown on, it's like do 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 and you're like, ah! and you'll go get it. It's just put it in front of your face. The, the most trash music, they can just buy the airtime and just put it on, whoops, I did it again. Do, do. And you're like, yeah, right, you know? You have to the most classic music. So, and look, I don't mind a little pop culture, don't get me wrong, some of it can be good. I have friends that do pop music, so you know, they could be watching this, like, I do pop music, oh, and what? You know, right, I got friends doing pop music. But I even say to them, like, make something classic. Like, why don't you make something classic? Why not come at what it is that you're creating like a G and make something amazing, make something timeless? When I'm coming at my best videos, I'm trying to make something people will watch in a thousand years. That's my headspace. I want people watching like Owen on, you know, virtual reality, like, to, you know, like all that kind of thing. Like, I want it crazy like that. Okay, maybe we're in that now. Maybe we're in the simulation now, right? It's actually possible, by the way. So you should consider that. So basically what you had, yeah, this is like a personal dream that you're in and I'm like, like that, okay? So anybody here feel like when you're watching me in, in person, it's like, it's like the movie Toy Story where the toy came to life? <laughs> it's like talking back at you. Normally you just stare at the screen, right? And I'm like, hey. And you're like, you, like people actually, because I'll do these events and I'll say hi to people and they just sit there and they're like, like that, and it's because they're used to watching me on a screen, you know, where I'm like, hey, like that, and you don't have to move or anything. You know, here you have to respond. I feel that way too. You know, some of my heroes, I see them on, uh, you know, online, I go meet them in real life, and they say hi, and I'm like, and I'm like, damn it, I'm like, I'm one of them now. You know, I'm do that same thing. Yeah, you guys ever see my Tim Pool interview? You ever see that? Yeah, yeah and I'm with Tim Pool, and I've been, I've been watching Tim Pool for years, you know? I'm good friends with uh, Luke Radowski. And so I'm, I'm watching, Tim's like, oh, and introduce yourself, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm a, a, a self help. I like that, you know, right? I'm like, Tim's talking to me. It felt so weird. It was like so great. He was so nice to me, but it's just like, it's funny. So anyway, um, the point being is that in your life, you got to say to yourself, I want the best. You've got to say that, I want the best. And you've got to start seeking this stuff out. Now, I made another video about this recently. You might remember it, where I was talking about how like, you can get amazing things right now starting today. Like people live in Los Angeles they've never been to Sequoia National Park and seen the biggest tree in the world. But they'll look at any crap put in front of their face. So you want to begin that process now where you stop just looking at things that are in front of your face and honestly going for the best. And raise your standards. Just say the word, raise your standards. Raise your standards. Say it again. Raise your standards. Say it again. Okay, that's truly what it is. You've got to raise your standards, okay? And what this does, look, again, I don't mind, you know, the lifestyle smoking, weed, eating the biscuit. I'm chill with that if that's authentically how you're meant to live. 
But what I've found is there's a trajectory in life that's oriented around expansion, and there's a trajectory in life that kind of causes you to stagnate. And that's really that's my greatest fear for my kids, right? Is you know they get in this kind of stagnation, and they're you know, and it's kind of like this festering rot. And this is a very deep topic. I can go a lot deeper on it, but that's what I don't want to see. It doesn't matter to me what my kids do with their lives, but I want them to be expansive and to grow, and not to just be stuck in this kind of festering rot and just like another floating turd in the system, okay? And being a battery for the System. So understand the extent to which the battery programming is so incredibly pervasive, and then start to design a life that you really, really want. You know, in my case, in the past year, I've traveled all over. I spent about 270 days outside. I recorded legacy-defining videos the entire process. Went skiing with my kids. I'm about to go to Alaska. As soon as I finish this, I'm doing a tour of Washington State outside. I'm going to be everywhere there, and then I'm headed to Alaska with my kids. And it's going to be just awesome. There's 30,000 grizzly bear up there. There's, there's calving glaciers where like these glaciers the height of apartment, the size and height of apartment buildings fall into the sea. And I'll be shooting a video with like a big grizzly bear on one side and like a giant calving glacier on the other side going, it's in, you know, and it's going to be sick, right? And it's not just that I need that to be happy. I can be happy without that. I could be happy if I knew that I had to be like that. Like, if I know that I can't do that, then I'm happy. It's like, okay, fine. But knowing that you could do other things and knowing that you could live a more expansive life, I think it's an utter waste not to take advantage of that. So what I want everybody here to do is I want you all to get serious about how you'd want to build your life and what you'd want it to look like. And talk to somebody beside you about how much it would suck not to get it, but talk about what it is that you want that would give you real fulfillment. Look, I like to get out there. I like to have adventures, you know? I love that stuff. For you, it could be something different. It's everybody's different at different phases of life. It's somebody who's 23 might honestly say, you know what, I'd like to be able to work directly from a laptop and in a cool place and just work all day so that I can build my systems. And that's beautiful too. So do that right now. Talk to the person beside you about what it is that you really want, how to gain urgency, how bad it's gonna suck if you don't get it, how to get there faster. Talk about that ideal life just for even a minute right now, the person beside you. The key thing that people don't get is that you don't know what good is. Okay, you don't have a context for what good is. Like if you've never seen social skills done at a high level, you probably don't know what good is. If you've never seen public speaking done at a high level, you probably don't know what good is. If you've never seen somebody who is spiritually tapped in at a high level, you're living in your kind of personal misery, you don't know what good is. If you're seeing it to where you've never seen people running businesses at high levels where everything is so tweaked and dialed and efficient, you don't know what good is. And that's what I'm talking about here is that you've got to start looking for the best and modeling the best because you're too much just taking in any trash from what's around you and allowing yourself to be programmed by people who you shouldn't be letting program you. It's very, very sad. It's going to cause you tremendous pain. Many of your friends are going to die from cancer, heart disease, statistically. They're going to have very, very boring lives. Not a lot's going to happen. Quick point you want to jump in there too? I think everything. I run a great mentor program. I think it's the best in the world, but you want to know something? It's not just about me. Frankly, it's about you. It's about also reading books. It's about taking action. It's also, like I've had mentors through my entire career, but it's still me doing it. Right, I'm still in a state of massive action, right? You know, Sid, he wanted to learn how to do public speaking. So he runs a multi-million dollar company and he goes, you know what, I think the kind of lifestyle business that you run is more fun than this. I don't want, Sid was on a path to, you know, he's going for billionaire and he's like, this sucks, I don't want to do this. He's like, I'm jealous of your company. Like I'm literally jealous of it. I want to go have fun and start kicking it with you. So he literally has enough passive income that he just started traveling with me and he just literally like just would carry my camera bag and things like that even though he's rich. And he would just come and just come and help out on programs and stuff like that, even though he's rich. He just wanted to be around the culture. Well, next thing you know, he's up here public speaking. Well, you see how quickly Sid learned how to public speak? I'll get him to come up here in a minute. But you see how quickly Sid learned how to public speak? Well, that happened because he's around that and he sees public speaking done at a high standard. There's a culture there that we've built of speakers. That's why every single speaker that I would work with in my organization became incredible speakers. They all got seven figure incomes. And in addition to that, I've also coached many of the top social media influencers, top in business, top in spiritual growth, top in dance, top in computer programming. Like, you know, name some weird topic. I probably coach somebody who's super famous. So these are people I'm coaching behind the scenes or big tech companies or um, just big businesses in general, big beverage companies, like mega, mega beverage companies and I'm coaching the founder behind the scene or things like that. So that's something that I'm always doing because for two decades, I'm studying and I'm going for results. I don't mind the weed in a biscuit lifestyle 
if that was authentic, I don't think it is. I think it's fake, I think it's BS. I have a huge value on my time. Major, major, major value on my time. I'm about speed and I'm not about discretionary spending, I'm about investing in myself and just building that and leveraging it.